In our final week, we'll study a cultural group that, in many ways, reveals how broad human cultural experience is and how inadequate our course's structure is for describing it. The Roma are unlike any culture we've looked at so far. Their daily lives have always been defined by states, but they aren't state-organized themselves, and neither do they fit easily into any of the other categories we've studied this semester. Furthermore, it's not even possible to begin discussing the Roma where we normally do with their location and environmental conditions. This is because the Roma have no homeland, but rather live dispersed throughout the world, scattered among other ethnic groups and nations. Today, there are somewhere between 12 and 15 million Roma in the world. The great majority live in Europe, as their people have for hundreds of years, but large communities have emigrated elsewhere, including the United States. The term Roma has only been in widespread popular usage for the last few decades. Before that, the people today called Roma were known by a wide variety of names throughout Europe, reflecting their internal cultural diversity. Roma in different parts of Europe practice a wide variety of different customs, sometimes having little in common with one another. About all that does unify these disparate Roma communities is their shared language, known as Romani, and their history of oppression, marginalization, and persecution. Wherever they've gone, they've always been the subject of widespread distrust and hatred from the majority ethnic groups they live alongside. Keep in mind that one of the characteristics of states, like all European states, is a strongly developed social hierarchy. Some groups have greater power, wealth, and prestige than others. In ethnically diverse states, again like Europe, ethnic minorities such as the Roma are often restricted to the lowest rungs on the social ladder. Because the Roma have no homeland of their own, they've historically been unable to consolidate their own social influence to improve their position in society. Instead, they focused on finding ways to make a living along the fringes of European society, surviving in the margins. The history of the Roma people is a bit unclear. For most of their history, the Roma have kept no written records of their own, and as lower class migrants, the European ruling class took little notice of them. Nevertheless, from fragments of historical records and linguistic cues, we can reconstruct a good idea of how they came to occupy the place they do. As we studied a few weeks ago, a diaspora is the dispersal of an ethnic group from its original homeland. The Roma do not constitute a diaspora because they have no homeland from which they've dispersed. Instead, their cultural identity developed over centuries of wandering. The best theory for their ultimate origins traces back to India around AD 1000. At that time, Mahmud of Ghazni, a Persian ruler, invaded and conquered northwestern India. Following the war, a large body of now homeless Indian warriors, their servants, and camp followers all moved slowly westward over the next several centuries. Along the way, they absorbed other homeless, disenfranchised communities, melding with them culturally and linguistically, until the resulting groups were no longer properly Indian, Persian, or anything else. By the 1300s, when they'd migrated into the Byzantine Empire in what is now modern Turkey and Greece, they'd become recognizably Roma. After arriving in Europe around the 13th or 14th centuries, most Roma have remained there, despite the general unfriendliness of the European ethnic majorities. Europe in the Middle Ages was already densely populated by complex and well-developed states, but it was also politically and economically highly unstable. The influx of a large number of poor foreigners was not welcomed by most European communities. Being landless and unwelcome, the Roma had little choice but to adopt a nomadic lifestyle. They couldn't farm, so they took up occupations that could be practiced while on the road. We'll look more closely at this service nomadism in a bit, but for now, let's focus on what it meant for the Roma's history. In Eastern Europe, where most Roma could be found in the Middle Ages, the skilled crafts they practiced, such as metalwork, music, carpentry, etc., led to their eventual enslavement. Eastern European elite, seeing a highly skilled but politically vulnerable source of labor, reduced the Roma to slaves in the middle part of the 14th century, 
Roma slaves in Eastern Europe were not freed until 1864. It's in Western Europe that the aspects of Roma culture most familiar to Americans can be seen. Roma entered Western Europe in the 15th century, fleeing persecution and enslavement in the East. Knowing by now to expect resistance, they adopted a variety of strategies to smooth relations. As they moved through the continent, they told the settled communities they passed through that they were Christian pilgrims headed for some far off religious center. Medieval Christians held pilgrims in the highest regard and thus were less likely to harass the Roma. It's from this little white lie that the English term for Roma, gypsy, probably derives. Some Roma groups probably claim to have come originally from Egypt, where English people were vaguely aware of a large Christian community. It should be noted, however, that today many Roma people consider the term gypsy to be a racial epithet. We should instead use their preferred term for themselves, which is Roma. While Western European Roma were not enslaved, they didn't fare all that much better than their Eastern brethren. Over the next several centuries, the Roma were persecuted, scapegoated for almost every misfortune, and driven out of one country after another. When the Eastern European Roma were freed in 1864, a new influx of migrants came into Western Europe, but by that time the prejudice against them was such that things were bound to reach a tipping point soon. That tipping point came, unfortunately, with the climax of European racism in the 1930s and 40s. Under Nazi rule, Roma were subjected to the same sorts of extermination campaigns as Jews. A half million Roma were killed in the Holocaust, an experience the Roma themselves refer to as the porajmos, or devouring. Following World War II, communist governments came to power in Eastern Europe, where most Roma still lived. Even though communist and Nazi philosophies are theoretically polar opposites of one another, the communists were only somewhat kinder to the Roma. They didn't attempt to exterminate them physically as the Nazis had, only culturally. Communist governments did not identify the historically poverty-stricken Roma as an ethnic group, but rather as an economic class. And of course, the whole goal of communist philosophy is to eliminate classes. A variety of laws aimed at assimilation were enacted, and the government's express goal was the eradication of Romani culture. Following the end of communism, these policies have been ended, as have the more explicit discriminatory policies in Western Europe. However, Roma communities still are subjected to much de facto prejudice today. This is why many have chosen to immigrate to the United States, where it's easier to hide their Romani heritage and blend in with a larger, more diverse population. Romani culture is difficult to discuss in general because the small, disconnected communities of Roma people throughout Europe have developed so many unique cultural practices throughout the centuries. As I said at the beginning of this lecture, there are only really two things that are shared among all Roma, their Romani language, and their history as a persecuted minority. But most Romani communities do have in common a sense of Romanipe, or Romaniness, a kind of family resemblance among communities based on shared cultural traits. No trait is necessarily universal, and every community has its unique customs, but many communities share many traits in common. One important part of Romanipe is the idea of service nomadism. This is a kind of nomadism very different from the pastoral nomadism of the Basseri. Pastoral nomads move to pasture their flocks and therefore must follow their own tribal road, a path they know will provide pasturage on a regular schedule. The Roma's service nomadism, on the other hand, is based on providing services that sedentary populations need. It can be practiced anywhere people live, so the Roma don't need to follow any set path or cycle of migrations, they can go anywhere and be reasonably confident of finding work. So how did this practice evolve? First, the nomadism part. Because settled European farming communities were unwilling to cede land to Roma to farm or even just to live on, the Roma had no recourse but to keep moving. After they'd been in an area for a brief time, the locals would almost inevitably force them out. This is why the Roma developed their distinctive caravan wagons, homes on wheels more or less, that allowed them to leave quickly and efficiently when things turned bad. 
the travelers still need money to survive in the market-based economies of states. This is where the service part comes in. Without land, there were very few ways to generate income in the Middle Ages. Services such as metalsmithing, music, and carpentry were among the best strategies to do so. In most cases, these sorts of skilled occupations are only needed occasionally by a small farming community, but when they are needed, the average farmer is out of his depth. So when a Romani caravan arrived in the area, people would initially be quite welcoming, bringing their metal pots to be fixed or hiring musicians to play at festivals. By the time the locals got fed up with the Roma being nearby, the work would have dried up, and the Roma would be ready to move on anyway. And because a service nomad doesn't necessarily have to return to, to any given place in the future, they could avoid areas where the local population had been particularly hostile. Of course, service nomadism was most developed in Western Europe, where the Roma had the ability to move freely. In Eastern Europe, movement was much more restricted or even impossible in those areas where they were enslaved. But where movement was allowed, the basic unit of Roma society was the company, the group that traveled and worked together. Traditionally, every household in the company had its own caravan, but all the households shared one common occupation. The whole company would be musicians or peddlers or practice some other skilled trade. This allowed for certain economic efficiency, sharing resources and advice freely within the company. The social structure within the company is one of the aspects of Roma culture that varies widely from one part of Europe to another. To simplify things, let's look at the organization of the Vlax Roma from modern Romania. Among the Vlax, the largest division is into four groups known as nations, the Calderash, Lovara, Curara, and Makvaya. Each of these names derives from the occupation its members pursue. Calderash, for example, derives from the same root as cauldron, and the Calderash were traditionally metalworkers. This tradition of naming social groups after their occupation probably traces back to the Indian caste system of the Roma's ancestors, as Indian castes are similarly named for occupational specializations. Each nation is divided into several patrilineal clans, and each clan is then further divided into extended family lineages. The lineage is the largest kinship group that normally cooperates. However, a single company will usually have members of several lineages, clans, and at least a few members of different nations. Lineages are exogamous, but spouses may belong to the same clan or nation. In terms of religion, the Roma are quite diverse. Over time, they've adopted the religions of the dominant ethnic groups in their regions. In Catholic nations like France, Roma tend to be Catholic, for example. But in Muslim regions of the Balkans, they practice Islam. They layer these larger religious traditions with a few unique practices of their own to inject a bit of Romanipe into their worship. The most distinctly Romani beliefs about the supernatural relate to an essential dualism in the universe. Everything has its opposite, and these two are to be kept separate except under carefully prescribed circumstances. Ideas of purity and pollution are central in daily activities, and maintaining purity is essential. Politically, the Roma present a conundrum. As part of European society, they theoretically exist as part of the same state organizations as their neighbors, subject to the same laws and leaders as everyone else. But as outsiders and nomads, they've always existed somewhat outside those structures. Internally, most Roma communities are normally very egalitarian, with decisions made based on consensus and debate, much like the kind of debate we'd see in tribal groups like the Yanomami or Trobrianders. However, in certain grave circumstances, a much more hierarchical structure emerges. Among the Vlax Roma, this is known as the Chris, a traditional tribunal convened to resolve disputes of great significance to the company. In a Chris, Several elders of the company are appointed by the company and granted absolute authority to make final binding rulings. The judges are tasked first with investigating the dispute, often some serious offense like murder, determining guilt, and if necessary, punishment. While everyone in the company can attend the Chris, only the judges may speak. Outsiders are absolutely forbidden from attending.
if a punishment is deemed necessary, there is no appeal or avoiding it. The worst possible punishment is exile from the company. For an underclass, persecuted minority, exile is worse than death as it separates the guilty party from the support of one's Romani peers, livelihood, and even identity. The Chris is much more hierarchical than normal egalitarian Roma decision making. This illustrates the somewhat chimeric nature of Romani culture, combining cultural patterns we see elsewhere in very different groups. It's probably a consequence of the Roma's history of just trying to get by and using whatever tools are available for the task of survival. But it also shows how inadvisable it is for anthropologists to become too reliant on the analytical categories we use to describe a culture. Cultures are, after all, made by people, and people don't always play by the rules others create. So are the Roma egalitarian, hierarchical, tribal, something else? It ultimately doesn't matter, so long as we learn something about human experience from the ways that they found to survive in a world that hasn't made them feel particularly welcome. In the end, that's probably the greatest testament to Romani culture, that despite their long history of persecution and unfair treatment, the Romani people have endured and maintained their cultural identity. Today, millions of Roma live all around the world. Many are still, unfortunately, poor and socially disenfranchised. But in recent decades, many have chosen to settle into permanent homes and begun to improve their standard of living. The nomadic lifestyle is still a major part of Romanipay, but it's no longer a necessity for survival. And that's a good thing. <laughs>